Uh, hello, everyone. Ron's going to get the slides up and going, but I want to start by thanking you all so much for joining us. Um, Ron and I are super excited to be here chatting with all of you today about change management. So I mentioned this in the promo for this session, and I've said it before, but I'm someone who thrives on in-person, face-to-face contact. And yet I think a virtual seminar is kind of the perfect medium to talk about change management because it serves as a really tangible example to just how much change we've all experienced in the past year. Um, sometimes the change comes in the form of your conference team having you use Zoom to present your communications best practices. So we are excited to be here on the Zoom meeting, uh, sharing a little bit with all of you today about change management. Uh, so we'll start with just some very quick introductions. I know Jason is not necessarily adequate, particularly when you're going from a uh, when you're when you're taking a very large leap technologically. Um, next question here, and Ron, I can probably take a stab at answering first. So, what are some of the methods of encouraging employee engagement through collaboration tools? Um, so, one of the things we talk about a lot in product is that you know, eighty percent of the features are you know are what is it? What's, what's the expression? Basically, you have this whole toolbox of features, hundreds of features, and it's only like the same 20 that are going to be used again and again. And there's that long tail of 80% that never gets touched. So again, understanding the use cases for your end customers and what success actually looks like is a really key and important part to actually understanding what success looks like. Is adoption getting everyone to use everything for all of their communication? Or are there key, you know, elements of communication that you were looking to replace with your system, things that you absolutely need to tick the boxes. The other thing I would say is that um, in any large communications rollout, there's kind of an initial spike as people are excited to use the tools, they wanna to get in there, they wanna play around with it. And then you tend to see usage kind of plateau. Either those same features are being used again and again, or people log in once and they sort of have a harder time returning to it. And knowing that that plateau is coming and will likely happen to your organization uh, can help you kind of plan ahead of time for what you know initial checkpoints do you need? Should you have another session? Are there things that you, specific groups of users that you can be targeting um, to anticipate that plateau of usage and potentially show them why this is so valuable and what it is that you're hoping to accomplish by moving to the system? And Ron, I know you work very closely with lots of customers on this, anything you'd wanna add? Yeah, yeah, this actually is very similar to to Morton's question uh, that we opened up with. And your last point is, I think, very, very critical, looking at specific user groups that you'd like to target. Uh, very often we see customers that are exposed to our full data set of usage and they say, hey, that's great. I have 50,000 calls in a month. Well, how do we quantify that? How do we actually consider that high engagement or low engagement? When we start to slice it up into particular demographics, whether it's regionally, whether it's aligned by business unit, whether it's um, you know a particular time and day, we start to understand the business a little more. And with our customer success team, uh, they can start to point out things that might be glaring to us, but not necessarily uh, not necessarily evident to yourselves. Um, and they add a lot of value as far as uh, highlighting, hey, actually, you know. In France, for example, um, this region ha actually has a depleted level of calls, seemingly low engagement. Let's figure out why that's happening comparatively against the rest of your offices. So um, it is important to look at things in uh, a contextual basis um, when you start to measure engagement, when you start to drive engagement as well. guys. Um, I actually have some questions <clears throat> for you here as well, some which are actually submitted just kind of in advance of the event itself, um, and others that continue on from some research we've actually been doing as an organization. The first is really geared towards ownership of change management. Now, we know, obviously, there's a, a big push from IT leaders and business leaders to, to really create that solid alignment between IT and the business. Um, and now, more so, more so than ever, um, technology is really the biggest driver of change, adoption of new technologies, new processes, et cetera, et cetera. So with that in mind, in your opinion, who should own change management? Is it IT? Is it the business? Is it a combination of both? Ooh, good question. Ron, do you want to kick it off or should I? Maybe we'll have different opinions. Yeah, I can. 
Yeah, I can I can definitely start with that. I think that um, where I personally have seen the most success is organizations that have a shared responsibility. Uh, it may be a techno uh, a technology led approach, but because it is changing the business as a whole, we need to start to take into consideration the business unit owners. We need to start to take into consideration the people themselves. And so where we start, where we see the success is the cross-functional committees that drive a lot of the accountability on the technology itself. So we see um, very frequently chief people officers and we see CIOs aligning um, prior to making purchasing decisions um, because that does impact, you know, uh, very, very large, uh, very, very large percentage, in some case wall to wall when we look at our deploys. Um, the other thing that uh, needs to be uh, that needs to be done, which very frequently I think is not done, um, is part of that decision is uh, is making sure that there is someone who's representing the interest of the customer. Um, I think many times we look at uh, ROI and we think of it from a savings perspective. We think of it from a oh, greater feature set perspective. But when we actually look at uh, who is represent representing the customer when these uh, tech and organizational decisions are getting made, um, the things start to change in terms of what are we trying to consider? Maybe it's something that uh, you know is less of a tech approach and more of an organizational approach instead. Come yeah, on. and Ron, to add to that answer, you know, you're exactly right. I think the most successful ones that we've seen are where there's kind of this shared approach. But we also know that we've seen lots of organizations that don't have either the buy-in or just the staffing and support to have both that organizational side and the technical side. Um, more often than not, they have the technical piece, but maybe not the organizational buy-in or resources available. But occasionally, you'll see it the other way around. And that's where it's really important to kind of where possible, pull in resources from the partner that you're working with. So, you know, again, at Fuse, we have this um, few success plans. And a part of that is, you know, if you're ready to run yourself, if you have the right resources lined up in your organization, take our playbook and run with it. But we recognize that sometimes organizations can't or don't have those. And so where can we help, if not fill the gaps, at least help communicate across those different business units and across the boundaries to make sure that those pieces aren't missed so say you don't have someone in your HR department or your chief people officer that's kind of taking on the adoption and communications in, uh, with end user pieces, where can we fill some of those holes either by doing it on your behalf or providing you with the materials for your IT teams to take it and run with it. Um, so again, perfect scenario, you have shared responsibility from the beginning, but when you don't, recognizing that that gap may be there and figuring out how you kind of fill those pieces and, and plug the holes so that you don't have it kind of pop up as, as a problem midway through. Fantastic, thank you. And um, to, to follow on from that question then, so Ron, you mentioned there, obviously requiring somebody to really act as the voice of the customer, to represent the customer. Now, um, for many organizations, the real customer business interaction happens at the lower level. It's people who are on the front line, uh, those customer service agents, for example. So with that in mind, um, are the principles, the very principles of change management changing now, like, you know, in the past, it's very much top down. Is it changing where it's now bottom up uh, and across the entire business? Yeah, I think I, I think it's less of a less of a top down up approach and and more of a full spectrum. Um, I think that the input that's getting provided into change management efforts um, is certainly a lot more inclusive um, because. At the end of the day, I think that uh, the folks that are on the front lines, the folks that are really answering the one-to-one -one communications with the customers are the ones that have a very, very large impact on how the revenue flows. And so the considerations that we make as organization uh, leaders um, need uh, need to really uh, need to really account for how those people are performing their work and what are the what are the workflows and so um, I definitely see a higher representation across the spectrum of decision making. It's a great question. Yeah, and, and if I may add to that too, I think even in the last five, 10 years, you've seen a change of who is even being considered for a cloud communication or a UCAS solution. Um, sort of when I started at Fuse and previously it was very much, we're looking to replace the communications for one section of users. Those are people that sit at the desk from nine to five in headquarters and in our other 
locations. And now, particularly, I'd say in the last four years or so, there's been a real focus on we want to have a solution that works for our in-office employees, as well as for those that are on the front lines. You know, we have some uh, healthcare customers that have sort of um, providers that are out in the field and taking calls from, you know, their phones. Um, we work with transportation companies that have, you know, people actually using to use out in the trucks. And so that consideration of who you're thinking of as your end user has expanded from just a very specific, very well-known population to a much larger percentage of the whole organization and kind of blends in office and frontline workers both. That's a, that's a really, really good point. I think, um, you know, the, the evolution of these sorts of conversations is something that, that does stick out, at, uh, stick out to me. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I guess it was eight years ago, but eight years ago when I started um, it, uh, U UCAS, uh, the this, this space was very different. Folks were, conversations were really driven based off of functionality. You know, can I barge into this conversation as a, uh, as a call center manager? Does this have caller ID um, on inbound calls? Simple things like that. And instead now we are getting con uh, questions um, around our solution uh, a, a, a sort, sort of in the nature of this is the business outcome that I'd like to drive. You know, how much experience do you have in helping enterprises do so? And, you know, how can you help best help me do so? Um, that's a very, very different conversation. And to Colleen's point, you know, it's, uh, it, it's something that, uh, that we are getting right from the beginning. And uh, it's a more, uh, it's a very different way of thinking about uh, how change management is driven. We've got another little question from Morton here. He's gunning for some prizes. <clears throat> I can see Morton and Vlad. I know these two well, and they're going to be <laughs> fighting with one another over the next three days. Um, I'm sure that brought a smile to their faces. But Morton asks, do you help organizations measure engagement um, and perhaps the use of collaboration tools and they're also by adoption? Uh, oh, that's... Uh... Sorry, there's um, that one was answered. Oh, yeah, that was uh, answered. Sorry, a new one. Would you try to yeah. predict what our collaboration within organizations with our external stakeholders will look like 12 months from now? I how will it continue to evolve? Yes, apologies. Ooh, love prediction questions. Um, yeah. So I have kind of two thoughts on this, and maybe I can start off with Ron. Uh, the first, please do, is that I think, and I've, I've talked about this a lot, I've been reading a lot about this, is this idea that the initial response to having to work remotely or having distributed teams was that let's just move everything to a video meeting. Let's replace every in-person interaction. If we need to talk about something, let's jump on a video call. Um, that has started to plateau and kind of tapered off, although overall the volume of calls is still much higher than it was pre-COVID. Um, and the percentage of calls with video on is much, much higher than it was pre-COVID. But I think from a communications perspective, there will be more of a push likely from employees themselves on how do we figure out a better way of working? Is there some other tool? Is there other processes in place that rather than just replace all meetings with in-person conversation over video, can we do something else? Um, our team is experimenting more with uh, asynchronous kind of like project planning on the side. We have some tools that we're playing around with where you sort of have like, I'm available to chat and people can kind of pop in and out sort of like you're seeing in um, live streaming of video games or that Twitch set up where you pop in and out of different um, conversations. And so I think from an end user perspective, you're likely to see more of that. Um, I think from a business perspective, the focus on interoperability and extensibility with your communications platform is likely to take a much higher strategic focus in the next 12 months and beyond. So it's fine to have to jump into Zoom to do something and to have a conference, but if you're working throughout your day, having to bounce back and forth between maybe your CRM like Salesforce into Zoom and out again gets a little bit cumbersome. And so how do we better blend those communications experiences with the tools that we're already open and using to do the rest of our job? Yeah, I think, I think you, uh, you took the words right out of my mouth there. I, I would actually add to that this, this concept of blended business practices. Um, you know uh, the the team that I oversee is is worldwide and and as such uh, the teams have specific regional flavors of doing business. Um, in addition to that, uh, the internal conversations versus the external conversations have sort of the same slant. What we're seeing now that uh, video has become the default 
um, communications method uh, and and sort of time has has lost a lot of the weight that it used to carry is that we're seeing teams from, for example, London interact with teams from Sydney um, and then also loop in a customer that's based out of Chicago. Um, there's, uh, there's a learning of the groups and learning of the workflows. They're all sort of blending their business practices together. And I, I do think that the collab space is, uh, it's, it's a very exciting uh, time because there's a lot more, um, this is probably just the tip of the iceberg as we all figure out the primary use cases, there's going to be a lot more blended business practice as we mature what our remote workflows look like. Fantastic. Excellent stuff. Well, thank you very much. A virtual round of applause goes to uh, both Colleen and Ron. So thank you both very much. Um...